test. Test, one, two, three, one, two, three, test. One, two, three. Is that good? Test, one, two, three. Good evening, hello everyone. Let's go ahead, let's start. Why don't we stand? Father in heaven, we come before you, we come into your presence, Lord, this evening, and we ask that you would take this service and have your way here in, in, among your people and, and individually as well, Lord, in, in our hearts and minds. We want to put our trust and our faith in you again, walk closer to you after we leave this place. We yield ourselves, Lord, to your spirit. Have your way in your people. Amen. The first song is, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Take a minute or two, fellowship a minute. Mighty God, everlasting, everlasting God. What a wonderful privilege it is, Lord, to worship you, to sing your praises, to shout for joy to our maker, to our Lord. 
blessed be your holy name. You are all that we need.
find refuge and strength and shelter. We want to say you are our Lord Jesus. We bless your name. Amen. And Father, we, may thy word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path tonight, Lord God. May you give us insight like only you can, Lord God. And we surrender our hearts to you tonight, Lord God. Work in us, Lord God. Reveal yourself to us through the Holy Scripture, God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so we are in the book of Isaiah tonight. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 3. So in this chapter, the prophet Isaiah goes on to foretell the desolation that was coming upon Judah and Jerusalem for their sins, both that of the Babylonians and that which completed the ruin by the Romans. So there are two times that this is going to be fulfilled, but there's going to be a third time it's going to be fulfilled as during the Great Tribulation. Now, the reason why it's going to be destroyed, and you're going to see how it is, is because of sin. They went into rebellion. They went into all kinds of different kinds of sins. And God tried to warn them, Isaiah with sin, specifically to tell them, yes, what's going to happen in the future. But he's warning them. And we see, because of history, as we look back, they didn't heed the warning. I like this saying, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose a consequence. Only God can. So we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> why God is doing what God is doing. And really, we're going to talk about God's judgment. OK, I need your attention. Sometimes when we look at God, we see him differently than who he really is. I know that God's character is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know God loves me without a doubt. I know that God is merciful. That's not getting what I deserve. Can all of us relate to that? Yes. I know that God is forgiving. I know that God is faithful. Do I know that God judges? <clears throat> I want you to think about this as a Christian. Now that you are forgiven, you are cleansed, and God's judgment is no longer on your life in any way. That doesn't mean that God's correction isn't. It's, I said God's judgment. When you stand before God, or when you look, God looks at you, he sees you totally forgiven. 
And that's how God wants you to come to him as a child that is forgiven and cleansed and washed. But that doesn't mean that God still doesn't judge because God does. And there's going to be a future judgment. Not only in this world, but in the spiritual world also. The Bible calls it a great tribulation where God will judge. A seven year period of God judging man's sin. Now all those people <clears throat> who will be going through that great tribulation, they may be people that you and I know and love. But let me give you this assurance. God will judge. But God sends his Holy Spirit out. There are people in my family who do not know Christ. And I pray for them constantly to have their eyes open to see, to respond to the gospel. And they haven't yet. But the Holy Spirit is being sent to them to reveal the truth. But if they reject it, then they will be under the judgment of God during the Great Tribulation. And if they die before that, then they'll be under God's judgment. But not without warning, not without the Holy Spirit sending forth constantly, telling them, look, I am who I am. That's Jesus speaking. So as we look to the teaching tonight, <clears throat> I want you to see a parallel with America. Because God's going to judge Judah and Jerusalem. You're going to see, I believe, a lot of things, and I'm going to point them out, that are happening and that God is doing in America. So let's start on verse <clears throat> 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. So here's the Bible speaks about, and he mentions the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And he speaks about the master, the God that's in control of all things, sovereign God. That's what his name means in the first the Lord. The second one means Yahweh, our triune God, emphasizing the power behind God. Now, we're going to see God's judgment on people who were warned and refused to listen to God. Is God just in doing that? <clears throat> I want to remind you, whatever God does is perfect. God cannot do anything that's not perfect because God is perfect. If God did do something imperfect, then he wouldn't be God. Amen. Now, that goes along with our own personal lives. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. All things work together for good for them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things. Does that mean that everything in my life is perfect? No. Does that mean that everything I choose is perfect? No. It means that God will work those out even when I make dumb mistakes or dumb choices. God will still work them out for good. And if I really want God's will, perfect will in my life, I have to submit myself to God every day and surrender myself to God. Let me give you an example. Today I was doing fine. I was studying. And then I started getting a little grumpy inside. Nobody did anything. I was just getting grumpy. I know none of you ever do that. Just me. <laughs> so I started getting grumpy and having an attitude. And literally, there was a fight between me and my old nature and my new nature. Like it says in Galatians chapter 5. 
And I kept on saying, no, 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 no. And I'm not going to say anything, and I'm not going to do anything, and no. And there was nothing that I, there was no problem at all. It was just me, but I was fighting inside. And so I said to God, I said, God, I'm going to submit myself to you in this. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to act a certain way. I'm not going to have an attitude. I'm not going to. And for about a half an hour, I was fighting inside. Well, Pastor, you've been a Christian for a long time, and you're a mature Christian. At least you're supposed to be. That sounds like you're having some fleshy problems. Duh. <laughs> Every one of you are going to go through f battles in your flesh. I don't care who you are or how old you are in God. It only lasted a half an hour. That's not bad. But I had to submit to God to overcome him. The God that is God. And I always like when Yul Brynner in the Ten Commandments came back from his victory, our victory, when he came back and he lost all his army. Remember that movie? How many remember it? Remember what he said to his wife? Moses is God, it is God. This is the God that we serve. So it makes this statement, <clears throat> takes away from Jerusalem, from Judah, the stock and the stores, the whole supply of bread, and the whole supply of water. I'm going to read a different translation to you. The Lord, the Lord of hosts of heaven's army, will take away from Jerusalem and Judah everything they depend on and every bit of bread and every drop of water. In other words, there's going to be a great famine. <clears throat> In about 586 B.C. and about 70 A.D., this happened to Israel or to Judah and to Jerusalem. The same thing that God said that would happen, it happened. And they were starving to death. And they were eating their own children. Not in 70, but 586. And this was the judgment of God on Judah. He took away everything that they had that would support them. And everything that they depended on to support them. So why does God do this? Is God mean? <clears throat> We as parents know exactly why we correct our children because we love them. Whenever you stop correcting your children, the Bible says you hate your children. That's pretty heavy. The Proverbs says, not the same word hate that we have in, in our vocabulary, I hate you. It's not that. It's that you don't love them enough, the Bible teaches, to correct them. And God, because of his love for us, the Bible says he chastens us. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, the Bible says, if you are a child of God, if you belong to God, no matter who you are, because of God's great love for you, he's going to chasten you. He's going to spank your little butt when you get out and do your own thing. He's going to do that. That's how it works. In fact, the book of Hebrews says one of the ways of knowing you are a child of God is because he chastens you. Because if he doesn't chasten you, then you're not one of his children. He must be chasing you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so God's taken away all of their food. A famine has happened. In fact, let me tell you, how stubborn Israel was. They had, in the Bible, there's 13 famines, and all of them were God's correction on Israel. When I look at Israel, <clears throat> I can also see the church some. 
Now, if I was to say to you tonight, are there any stubborn Christians in this room tonight? Uh -huh. <laughs> Every one of you in God's house can't lie now, but have to raise their hand. So God in his correction takes away that, but he also takes away all the water. Everything that would sustain him, God removes. And again, I believe that God allows these things to happen to bring us back to God and his perfect plan. Amen. But God only not brings us back to that plan. <clears throat> he brings us to a place of his blessings. If we could see God's heart of how he wants to bless our lives. And sometimes it takes us until we get to a certain age, not because it's God's will, it's because of my choices and I finally give up that I can see the plans that God has for my life personally and for you personally. Sometimes we fight them against God's plan and don't even realize we're fighting against it. So God will allow certain things to happen and God allows famine. Verse 2. <clears throat> Listen to what else he does. The mighty men of war, the judges and the prophets, the diviners of the elders. So these are all the leaders the ones that are supposed to be brave and courageous. These are the ones that give justice, are supposed to. These are the ones that prophesy. But there's two thoughts in this. The first thought is, these people are godly men that God removes because of God's judgment. Or they are only God, ungodly men who God removes because of their ungodliness and God judges them also along with the people. So I have to come back to this place in my thoughts about America because I'm going to mention it a few times. And if it's the thought of God removed these judges, these brave men, because they themselves were evil, I'm wondering if God is going to do that to America. Because I believe, without a doubt in my mind, that America is under judgment and that we are going to be judged as a nation. I don't say that with joy or with, oh boy, I hope this happened. It isn't that, that's not in my heart at all. I'm sorrowful. I love America. But you're going to see a lot of similarities between Israel and America that if God's the same today, yesterday and forever, then God has to do this. And if he did it to Israel, his own people, why wouldn't he do it to America? Israel was the most blessed nation in the world at that time. Amen. They had God's favor. And America has been the most, I personally believe, blessed nation in the history of the world. Amen. And because of Christianity, being the, the number, one, number one most important thing us as a nation, proclaiming the gospel more than any other nation before us and after us. God had favor on America. Amen. But you're going to see some similarities of what America is at and where Israel was at at that time and where we are today. Now, he says in verse 3, <clears throat> The captains of the fifties and the are honorable men, and the honorable men, the counselors and the skillful artisans and the experts and chanters. So what he says here is God's going to remove these people, take them out of the way. 
So there will be no honorable men, men that support or sustain what the word means. There will be no counselors, advisors, or consults, consultants. There will be no skillful artisans. The wise and the cunning magicians. There'll be no expert enchanters, which is against God, which they had then. And then he says this in verse 4. I will give children to, the, to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Different translation. I will make boys their leaders, and toddlers their rulers. In the Hebrew, it speaks about these babes being full-grown men who are juvenile inside. So they'll be immature and ignorantly will rule over them, ignorance. So uh, imagine this, all the people that had any wisdom, any kind of counsel are removed. And then he's gonna, God's gonna put people in there that act like juveniles mentally. I want you to look at our nation. Has God removed all godly men or men that have any kind of counsel? After World War II, <clears throat> First of all, during World War II, we had some great men in our nation. We had great men who fought in that war and came back and did great things because they, they believed in God, they followed God. But think about this, beloved. Today in our nation, do we have any great leaders at all? I mean, really sound men that follow God and walk with God and have counsel, that know how to fix problems and deal with things. Do we have any administrations that are like that? I personally believe that God has removed all of the good leaders in the last years, and he's put men in, in these places and women in these places who are juvenile. It says, babes shall rule over them. And we have babes that rule over us as a nation. Listen to what it goes on and says in verse 5. Talking about Judah and Jerusalem. The people will be oppressed. Everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. This word oppressed literally means it will be under tyranny, lord, extractor, will be hard pressed. Do we see that in our nation today? This comes from the ungodly, incompetent leaders. And they say that there was going to be a breakdown, and there was at this time in society. And think about this, the things that we're seeing in our world today and in America are exactly what God said he would allow to happen because of judgment upon this nation of his, his people. It says that a child will be insolent toward the elder. The word in the Hebrew means to behave proudly, to act stormily or boisterous or arrogant. I want you to stop and think and see where our nation's at concerning this same thought. BLM, Antifa, he goes on, he makes this statement. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, you have clothing, you be my ruler, and let these ruins be under your power. Different translation, in those days a man will say to his brother, since you have a coat, you be our leader. Take charge of the heap of ruins. 
In that day, verse 7, he were protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, for in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people. So he says, no, I don't want to rule. I have the same problems you, and I can't fix them. I have no answers. Verse 8, for Jerusalem stumbled, and Judah is fallen because of the tongue and their doings. And the things are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his way. So it speaks here about Judah stumbling and Jerusalem stumbling and Judah is fallen. Let me read these words to you because I think they're part, pretty important. They are caused to stumble, to bring injury or ruin to, to overthrow, to make feeble and to make weak. Now, these people who God loves, these are God's people, but because they would not turn or repent from what God was warning them to do and to turn away from it and not have part of, of literally, this caused them to be weak and caused them to be stumbled and to be injured and to be ruined. What God was trying to do is stop them from ruining themselves. Think about that, beloved. When God works in our heart, he's trying to stop us from ruining our families by our choices because that's what sin does. Listen to the second part. Judah has fallen to be cast down, to fail, to prostrate oneself, to fall into the hands. Again, <clears throat> not because of what God wanted. God wanted that because of the choices that they were making. And because of their tongues and their doings. So I want to read a scripture to you. Turn this with turn there with me. Keep your finger here. Matthew twelve, thirty six and thirty seven. Matthew twelve, first book in the New Testament. You there? Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say to you, that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is exactly what happened to Judah and Jerusalem by their words that they spoke, but also by the things that they practiced, their doings, the deeds that they were doing. And this is why part of the reason is why God sent judgment. Verse 9 says, And they looked on their countenance as witness against them, and they declared their sin as Sodom. They did not hide it woe to their souls, for they have brought evil upon themselves. So it says here, they looked on their countenance and witnessed against them. In other words, their guilt is seen on their faces. When my kids were young, they were little. I would say to them, did you do that? And you could read it on their faces right away. <laughs> Sometimes they'd say, uh, and I would say, you're going to get in trouble if you lie to me. And I could see it on their faces. You could read it. And they would say, yeah, I did it. And that's what God's saying. When we do things, we may not be able, we may be able to hide it. But you can't hide it from God. And it says there, it'll be a witness against them. And they declared that sin and Sodom. So in other words, 
they exhibited no shame at all. Now, some of them, they could, you can see it, but others, they acted like what they were doing is fine and okay. Let me read this word to you in the Hebrew, declare their sin. Conspicuous, make known, to announce, to report. Sin is out in the open, and no covering upon its sin at all. So, literally, they were doing their sin, and they were not afraid to do it in front of anybody at any time. I was watching the news about a year ago, maybe it's not that long ago, and they brought up the gay parade. And if you watch it for more than six seconds, you're gonna be sick and throw up. But I watched it for a little bit longer than that because I was amazed how many parents brought their children to it. The streets were lined with families, and I mean lined with families. And there were people who were dressed the most grotesque that I've ever seen in my life, personally. And I thought to myself, they have no shame at all. The things that they were doing was no shame at all. They didn't care. They didn't care if God saw it or didn't care about it at all. And they didn't care who, who they tantalized, so to say, with the little children. Then I, I began to feel an indignation. And I thought, those parents who brought their children need to be punished. Some way or another, take their kids away. Now, it's hard when you see children being trained, are programmed into things that are so ungodly, so shameful. But this is exactly what they were doing too during this time. No shame. I'm not ashamed of my sin. You don't like it too bad. They did not hide it. And the God says, woe to that soul. For they have brought evil upon themselves. And this can be true of any of us. This word brought, I think it was pretty interesting, to deal out, to recompense, to repay, requisite. In other words, reaping and sowing, as we'll see in a moment. Their sin that caused God to deal with them were in this verse, their defiance of God. One day, God is going to deal with, again, America, but he's going to deal with this world like I shared earlier. It's called the Great Tribulation. God's wrath on mankind for their sin. Now, you don't want to be here. And how you're not here is, as you be, is become a Christian. The Bible says that God has not appointed us to wrath, and that's God's wrath. No appointment for Christians. Now he goes on, say to the righteous that it shall be well with thee, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. So God makes a promise to those who are righteous, they're always a remnant. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the people that would go and be taken to Babylon about 586 BC. There were men like Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, who were taken. And can you say that God protected them even though they were taken to Babylon? Amen. Many of them, the leaders, were taken who were godly, who prospered. In fact, when it was time to go home, one of the kings, I'm trying to think of his name, not Belshazzar. 
Cyrus, who was king, had released the people of Israel after 70 years in captivity. He says, you could all go home. But what happened was they had become so wealthy, many of them, they wouldn't leave. And God blessed them. They multiplied in children. God blessed them. But this was the righteous. Now, we live in very hard times and difficult times. I don't care who you are. We deal in stressful times. There's more anxiety, there's more fear. There's more, what do I expect tomorrow? Those questions are in our minds on a regular basis. And God makes a promise that if you belong to him, that you'll be okay. God will take care of you. He'll be well with you and you'll eat the fruit. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna go through any trials. It means God's gonna see you through those trials, that God's gonna be there with you and God's gonna take care of you. God promises that. I believe we are on the brink of the rapture of the church. And right after the rapture happens, the great tribulation happens. But I believe that we're going to go through some things as Christians. And we need to prepare ourselves. Amen. There can't be any more slumbering, sleeping Christians. You have to be awake, doing and preparing for battle every day. Every day you need to get up and put on the armor of God and prepare yourself for what's ahead for that next day. That's so important. But God makes a promise, and he fulfilled it. He took care of those people who were righteous. This is comfort to us when devastation comes. The Bible teaches that God is going to shake the earth, but the Bible teaches it will be well with you and with me. This is an encouragement for those who are holding out and doing what is right also. Sometimes we get discouraged and we feel like it's not worth it. The righteous will reap from doing what is right. I want to remind you that Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, or in due season we shall reap if we don't faint. So probably you, some of you this week probably felt like fainting. Amen. God will catch you. Ron Hembry writes in his book, The Fruit of the Spirit, this. There are years in South Africa where locust swarms the land and eats up the crops. They come in hordes, blocking out the sun. The crops are lost, and a hard winter follows. The year that the locusts eat are feared and dreaded. But the year after the locusts, South Africa reaps its greatest crops. For the deadly bodies of the locusts serve as fertilizer for the new seed. And the locust here is restored as great crops swell the land. This is a parable of our lives. There are seasons of deep distress and afflictions that sometimes eat all the usefulness of our lives away. It promises that God is, will restore the locust years if we endure. We will reap if we faint not. Although now we do not know all the whys, we can be assured our times are in his hands. Amen? Amen. Now, he goes on in verse 11. Woe is the wicked. It shall be ill, Ill with them, for the reward of his, rewards of his hands will be given him. So again, the people who are wicked, God makes a promise. They're going to reap whatever they sow. And again, I want to read another scripture to you. It's in Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. This is for all of us as Christians or non-Christians. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he reap also. For he that soweth to his flesh so reap of his flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall 
of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So it's important, beloved, that you and I as Christians today, that we sow to the Spirit, not to the flesh. Sir Walter Watt, the inventor of a radar, was arrested himself for speeding. He had been caught in a radar trap. Shortly after the disarmament, he wrote this poem. Pity Sir Robert Watt, strange target of radar plot, and this with others I could mention, a victim of his own invention. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? We are victims of our own inventions many times. Now, it says here the sins of the impudence. These are the sins that are without thought of consequence. Are lacking in judgment, our caution, rash or indiscreet, impotent speech, our behavior. So we need to be careful of those kind of sins. Now, verse 12, as for my people, children, all their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err, and destroy the way of your path. So it says here that, as for my people, children are their oppressors. Young people. And this is what was going on during this time of Isaiah that he's writing and is going to happen. This is what happened in AD 70, many believe. And this is what is happening, I believe, today in America. Our colleges are so messed up. When my older grandkids wanted to go to college, they went to, I think, like 12 or 13 colleges in the United States. Their dad and mom took them all over to see what colleges were conservative, that weren't colleges that would brainwash them. But I thought about this. I thought, maybe they shouldn't even go to college. Because if you look at the education that is coming from the colleges, first of all, there's no education. And our children coming out of colleges are usually socialists after they come out, or communists. Imagine these young ones leading the nation. Unfortunately, some of them are. It says, and they destroy the way of your path, the road that you take, they're destroying it. The Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. So in other words, now that God here is, he's saying that he is both the judge and the prosecutor in this case. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes, for you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. Notice, he who judges first, the leaders. They will be given an account first, for theirs were a greater giving of an account, James says in chapter three. Verse 15, why do you, what do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. So these leaders were literally taking advantage of the poor and using the poor. But what does God say today about dealing with the poor? Someone asked me this question the other day. 
And the thought crossed my mind, are there really poor people anymore? When we read in the Bible about a poor person, we're talking about a person who was probably a serf. He could be a man that was maybe bought and owned by another man for seven years if he was a Jewish man. And he would be taken care of, fed, housed, clothed. And you would call that a poor man. Today, I don't know if in America, I would say, maybe in the world there's poor people. And there is, I'm sure. But in America, I sometimes wonder, and if there are poor people, is it chosen? Is it a choice that they make? The Bible does say and reminds us that he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and God will reward them. I really believe that God wants us to help people but not be abused by people or not be used by people. There's a difference. Now he goes on. In verse 16, moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingle with their feet. So we see God begin to speak to women and begins to say that they thought they were better than everyone else. And he begins to describe their haughtiness, being arrogant. And that is not what God wanted his people in any way to be. We as people need to be careful Because God warned his people in the Old Testament that be careful that when you get all these homes and you get all these blessings of mine that I'm going to give you, that you don't forget who gave them to you. Every good thing is from God from above. Everything you have, if you have a nice home and you have a nice car, you have a nice truck or whatever it may be, the Bible says it is from God. Amen. You might say, well, I worked hard and it's mine. No, you are a temporary steward of what belongs to God. So what's really neat about that, if you have that kind of heart set, is when something happens to it, and God, something's wrong with your truck today. <laughs> That's a good thing. You're going to have to take care of it, God. And God will, I believe. But it's so easy to get arrogant, think you're better than other people, and say oh, you're so much smarter. And it's really only by the grace of God. Also, we need to be careful of pride. It will blind you to your sin and to what is going on in your heart. It will cause you to take no instruction. They say pride is the worst of sin, or it is what causes the devil to fall. And then they say all pride comes from, all sin comes from pride. Now, God wanted his women to be lowly and meek, the Bible teaches in Peter, but they weren't. And so God is going to judge them also. Listen to what verse 17 says. Therefore the Lord will strike him with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. So in other words, everything's going to be seen of how they really are. 
The no secret with God, I found. He sees and knows everything that we do, and he knows all about me and you. Some people believe that this scam that he's talking about are hidden diseases or venereal diseases. It could be. Verse 18, in that day the Lord will take away the finery. And now he's going to talk about this lady who's proud and he's going to take away all these things that they wear. The jinglings, anklets, the scarves, and there's crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the hairdresses, the leg ornaments and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms and the rings, the nose jewels, the festival apparel, and the mantles, the outer garments, the purses and the mirrors, the fine linen, the turbans and the robes, and so it shall be, instead of a sweet smell, they will stench, they will stink. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, girdings of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. So we see the Lord replaces the refinery with marks of captivity and humiliation. God takes away his blessing because of their sin. I can totally understand, and you should be able to too, real easily, how destructive sin is and how much it takes away and what it costs us and what it costs our children. I've been hearing this in my spirit a lot lately. What if? What if I wouldn't have done this? Where would I be? Or what if I would have done this, and where would I be? What if I would have continued to do that 25 years ago in what I'm doing now? What if I would have started then? Would that have saved me from this pain and this sorrow? What if? And I know people say, don't say what if. You can't change it. But it's good to look back and see what if, so for the future you will do, you won't what if. Now he finishes in verse 25. Young men shall fall by the sword, and you're mighty, and the my, you're mighty in the war. So again, God's judgment, they lose the battle. And you see this in Israel's history. There are times that they'd be outnumbered the opponents a hundred to one, and God would say, no, I'm going to judge you because you're completely in the re rebellion against me. And those hundreds of, young, of men that were against Israel would go in there and slaughter them. And God says they would fall, and fall, the mighty would, would fall in war. Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit on the ground. The city was completely devastated. And all those people who were beautiful like the women in these dresses and being dressed like they were, they lost their beauty. I'm amazed at the God that we serve. And I say that with this thought in mind. God is only looking after our own interests and how much he loves us and the blessings that he wants us to have. When a Christian comes to the point in their life that they realize, giving their life fully and wholly over to God is the best thing they can ever do they're on the right path, they're on the right road. Because you're on the path that God has chosen for you personally, and God has many blessings on that road, on that path. But when I stay in the middle and I say to God, 
I need, when I need you, God, make sure you're there. But during the meantime, I have a lot of decisions I need to make, and I got it, God. I'm sure that God says, okay, you got it, and you'll get it. God's way is always the best way. God's always the way is always the easiest way. And when we get off that road, because of God's great love for us, He'll chasten us. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for all the blessings of the learning that we can go and gain from God concerning the history of your people, Lord. And I ask God that you would continue to do what only you can do. For you know all things, God, and you're all wise, and everything you do is perfect, God. So Father, as we continue to surrender our hearts over to you, our wills, our lives, as we submit ourselves wholly to you, God, have your way. Be Lord. And Father, when you do chasten us, may we yield, Lord God, and may we see quickly, Lord. And may we see your hand of love, God, in all things. Remind us, Lord, that you also are a God that judges God. Not us. We're chastened. We belong to you, God. But this world, in Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Okay, any questions on our study tonight?